So thank you. Uh, it would be easy to be distracted by robots. I'll uh, get back to that. But first, we're going to practice. I know it's early, but all of you have to stand up. I'll, I'll enter stage again, and you can really welcome me like you want me to be here, OK? So we, here you go. Thank you, thank you. It felt much better. I'm gonna to talk to you about what's happening around IT and uh, how every company and every organization, especially on a country level, is digitalizing their whole, or all their processes, everything they do. I'm trying to give you some advice on the, on the road. I hope I don't scare you. Actually, uh, Estonia is quite well off. Let me start by saying that. Uh, I travel around the world all the time, and you're better off than most places. You're better off than where I come from in Norway. So let's start out by giving some, some good thoughts. So what is really happening? Well, it's something dramatic that shifts or changes. And if you look back in history, we call that revolution. Some people say that we're now in the third industrial revolution, the digital revolution. So let's remind each other, and I did this when I talked to all the employees yesterday, I, I all told them that there is a reason why we, have, why we have history in school. You know, there's actually two. It's to learn what not to do, and it's to learn what to do. And if you look back, the first industrial revolution, sometime 1810, 20, something like that, it was all about mass production. So we needed to produce more effective, especially food, clothes, and stuff like that. And you, I can see that none of you were around at that time, but you might remember from school. And then about 60, 70, 80 years later, you had the second industrial revolution. It was all about transportation. So that's when we had you know, the steam engine coming and the train and the steam uh, boats, eventually the car, and a little later, the plane. So now we have the third industrial revolution. And the big thing about revolutions is that the change happens really rapidly. And it changes the landscape when it comes to who is competing against who, and there is always new competitors that emerge in times like this. So I'll talk more about that. But let's imagine that we are at the start of this digital revolution. So why is, why is really, really that important? Because everything is connected. You know, and it's not only Atea or me that say that we're in this, this emerge of this revolution. Everybody talks about this, even on an EU uh, and a financial, from a financial point of view. It's something that touches everybody. Everybody from your not even born child to my dad, 85, and everybody in between. It changes something every day for all of us, also on an EU and financial uh, side. So what is it really that has happened? Because I talk to a lot of customers and they say, well, you guys in the IT sector, you always promise us the moon and then you deliver something less. Or you say that things will change really rapidly and now look here, we're doing the same thing. Well, the really big difference this time is that we've turned or we've reached the digital tipping point. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we're at a stage where almost all information, almost all people, at almost every time or place, is connected or reachable digitally. So think about it. Almost all, and I say almost because I know not all of it is, but from now I'll, I'll say all. So all information is reachable digitally. 
if you think of it, it's pretty close to being true. I mean, what kind of information, you know, music, pictures, newspapers, articles, books, processes, you know, almost everything is reachable digitally. And almost all of us, as individuals or organizations, are digitally reachable at all times. It's almost something that you know, we like to get away from sometimes, but we're really connected at all times. So we reach this tipping point, because if you go back five years, that wasn't true. Not all people were connected at all times, and not all information was reachable digitally. So we reached this tipping point where you, as a producer of a service, a process, a product, you can assume that your users, your customers, are reachable digitally, that they are digitally native, so to speak. And that changes a lot. Because think about it for some, you know, some small examples. Let's take a journalist. Are there any journalists here? I know there are, so you're, you're undercover, I guess. Um, let's say five, ten years ago, to make an article or a blog or something. Well, we didn't even have blogs, did we? But uh, an article, you had to sit down and write it. And I'm not talking about 20 years ago. I'm not, I'm not talking about the typewriter. I'm talking about writing it. And then you had to hand it in or send it, and then it had to be set, and then it had to be produced and delivered physically as a newspaper. And the whole process took eight hours, 12 hours, and you might reach 10,000, 100,000 maybe readers within 24 hours. And then the article was dead because you throw away the newspaper. So what happens today? Well, in 10 minutes, you can reach millions of readers or people you want to influence. And you don't have to go through all that process because you can rely on things being digitally. Your readers, your users, your process. And you can think about all your processes, what's happened when it's gone from analog to digital and the fact that we've reached that tipping point. It changes everything we do. And it's really interesting, because I think about this all the time. I meet hundreds of companies every year, and they talk to me about all the things they're doing to make things digital. I think this film I'm going to show you can get your creativity in, uh, and you know, maybe going a little bit. So let's take a look at this.
So this film was made about two years ago. So this is old stuff. You guys probably do all this now. But think about if your kids, I mean, I'll introduce my two kids to you. They're now 20 and 21 year old, uh, a girl and a boy. When they went to school, you know, when they started school, if they could have had those kind of things, you know, that would be cool. That would be really cool. And, you know, also how you treat information today is very old fashioned. You know, it's going to become alive in a different way, just like you saw here. Because the notion of how you pro project information, screens and everything, you know, it's changing all the time. And, and we're going to consume information in a very different way only a couple of years from now. So why is this happening right now? I mean, why have we reached this tipping point right now? Well, there are three or four reasons for it. So let me take you through all of them. One is purely technology. So some years ago, and I actually remember this, I know it doesn't look that way, but I do remember when this happened. And some of you remember where you had the terminal and it was depending on the RS-232 ports and cables, you remember? You can nod, you know, even though it's a long time ago. But it was very limited because you were limited to where you could consume the information, how many who were connected to the same system as you and what kind of let's say, application or functionality you had. We call that the first platform. It was very much Terminal's mainframe. And then you remember the client server. You know, eventually we got the Novell networks and we could actually print from our own PC in our office. Wow. And we could send email. And internet was really alive in the middle of the 90s. And we felt like we had conquered the world. Well, now, we're at the rise of the third platform. Some of you might say, well, that happened a couple of years ago, and some might say, well, we're not all there yet, but it's here now. And that platform, if you think about it, is pretty amazing because we can, we can discuss and debate, but I think it's pretty robust. It is pretty secure. And I'm not talking about not breakable, but I'm talking about, in general, pretty secure, pretty robust, mostly wireless, and you can do anything from anywhere. I mean, isn't that pretty fantastic? In a couple of, or 20, 25, 30 years, we've gone from something really not that usable to something that means that you can travel around the world and be connected, and even in the plane, you can send your emails. I think that's pretty amazing. So the technology that has developed over this time is one of the reasons why we've reached this digital tipping point. It is technology that has made it possible. It is not technology that has taken this or taken advantage of it, but technology has come to a level. So if your organization, if you are not at a robust, secure, and wireless infrastructure, come and talk to us and we'll help you. And secondly, it's all about us, the humans, the human factor in all this technology. And I think that is where we have the biggest trouble right now is because if you look at the whole population of a company or a country or a region, we are not acting homogeneous in our way of consuming or being tech savvy uh, when it comes to looking at this opportunity. And Bill Gates said many years ago, you can see on the picture, this is many years ago, where he said that we overestimate things in the short and underestimate in the long. And the reason for that, and this is important, and I want you to talk about this during the day, and, and you can come and talk to me about it, but for all times, humans 
have approached change in a linear way. Meaning that the speed of change is linear. It might have a different angle to it for different things, but it's all linear. What do that mean? And why is that? And, and what does it mean? Why? Because everything has been physical. So I want to make one, so it takes that time. I want to make 10, it takes maybe not 10 times, but five times, six times, it's all linear. And that have made us think the way we do. So we've thought, well, I don't have to be first out of the gate because I can always take, you know, overtake them on the second round or next year or when the next generation of the technology comes or when all the others have failed or, I mean, so we approach things linearly. And think about it. It makes a difference because you can make up lost time because it's not really that far away even though you wait a year. You could even do that in school, you know, I'll, I'll study for the exam when it's one week left, you know. It's not really that difficult. Well, I'll tell you, my son that now studies in the United States, he has to study every day because they have digital exams every day. And it has to be done. If not, you get the grade of zero. Every day, not in every course, but every day he has something. And that is possible. You couldn't do that in an analog world because it's not, you can't, I mean, the teachers and everything can't handle it. But in a digital world where everything is corrected digitally, and it's just a small exam, it's not, it doesn't take hours and hours, it takes 20 minutes. It can all be corrected online. He gets his result within two minutes. I haven't seen it, you know, but he tells me. He tells me over Viber. So I talked to him. I can see him in America. When I studied in America, I didn't see my parents for two years. You know, you couldn't call on a fixed line. It was so damn expensive. And talk about video? No way. Flying to America? My parents? That was a long, long way. The world has really, really changed. It used to be linear. It is still linear in most people's heads. And that is why when I grew up in the 60s, and you remember in 62, Kennedy said, we're gonna to go to the moon, in 69, they actually landed. I grew up in that period, so I wanna be an astronaut. And everything that I thought of was to fly something, and the car should look like this. And I think it's, you know, in my mind, it is the perfect example of how humans think linear. I mean, if you look at this, it's a picture of a picture that I used to have in my room because I thought I would have one when I grew up. Well, I'm now 50 and I still don't have one, but I'll get back to that. They actually thought that a flying something would look like a car, but flying. I don't, I'm not sure how they can make this thing fly, and I don't think they've even thought of how it could fly, but they thought of putting out a big steering wheel from an American car in the 50s because we think that way. We think linearly. You know, if something is going to make, be made digital, it's going to look like the analog process. Well, it's not. And this is the reason why some companies today, and you've heard this, Kodak, Nokia, you know, they try to have a linear development and suddenly they run out of speed and someone comes and overtake them in a week. It's really strange. Out of the, five, uh, uh, the 500 biggest companies in the US 15 years ago, only half of them still exist. That would never have happened 50 years ago or 40 years ago. So things are going very, very fast. And again, I thought I would have one like that before I was becoming an ad adult or grow up. Uh, I, I even talked to my dad about it and he said, are you stupid? You know, I'm an engineer, things like that can't fly. Well, he was correct actually, even though I hated saying that. 
So what is happening? So the new CEO, Satya, that I met three or four weeks ago in Seattle, he's talking about the fact that we are the first generation, maybe not me, but you, the first generation that will actually live in a world that changes exponential. So it's not linear anymore, it's exponential. And that means if you miss the curve, you're out of the game. There is no way of catching up. So either you're there in the development or you're not. That's why Kodak missed the curve. I actually talked to the Swedish organization for taxi um, companies six or seven years ago, seven years ago. Um, and I talked to them about digitalizing their process and everything, and they kind of laughed at me and said, you crazy IT kid, you know. Um, we're a physical company, you know. We have cars and drivers and, you know, everything is legalized, and so what the hell should you digitalize by, you know, get the hell out of here. Well, you know what happened. Now they're trusting the lawyers to stop innovation, to stop progress. Uber is not allowed in Norway, Sweden. I don't think it's allowed here either. You don't just care. Um, but that is a known tactic for stopping progress. You know, we missed the curve, okay, but we'll use law to stop development. That has happened many times. It will come many times in the, in the future where that will happen too. But the fact is, they lost the curve, and there is very, it's very difficult to catch up. So how did really that flying car develop? Well, some might say it ended up as a helicopter, but that's not true, because helicopters were wrong, and they are not for everybody. But it looks like this, and I have ordered one. You know, I am in line 50 years later, I might get my dream fulfilled, you know? But this is actually running. And it's the first drone that can carry people. It is the promise of the flying car. Of course, you can't steer it. You know, it's digitally steered by GPS points. And it doesn't crash. You know, and it's really, really cool that even though I dreamt of it before I was 10, I will be able to do it in a linear world. In an exponential digital world, this would go much, much faster. But, you know, I'm looking forward to the day where I can, where I can drive one of those or, or be a passenger in one of those. So there is a technology reason for why we are at the tipping point, and there is a human. So more and more in the younger generation consume and look at information in a different way than maybe I do. But there is also a third reason. And, you know, it's pretty obvious, but we, we, we forget it sometimes. You know, this is a picture taken about 10 years ago in the Vatican uh, at a big, uh, and you might have seen this picture on the internet. Uh, it was actually around in 2005. Um, big occasion, okay? Everybody looks at what happened. And then when the new pope was put in place in 2013, it doesn't look like they're looking at the pope. They're looking at the pope through the digital device. Because what really happened between 2006 and 2013 was the invention or, um, you know, the, the, the mass invention and production of smartphones. So this came and it changes everything. Because from being physically concealed to a place to interact digitally, suddenly you had it with you everywhere, and I mean everywhere. And that changes a lot in this equation. So technology, humans, and then the smartphone. 
which makes you connected. But anyway, when I was making this presentation a week ago or two, there was the first debate in the American election. I'm not going to talk about the election, okay? But I, it, I was just going through something that happened overnight in America, and I was looking at a picture, and then suddenly this picture came, and look at it and see if you see something strange. I mean, I looked at it first and I thought, okay, so she probably won the debate because, I mean, I was just waking up and I had my, I have to hate to say that, but I have my smartphone with me at bed. So it's the first thing I look at in the morning. So I was looking at it and I was going through some, some news and this picture came up. And it's really strange. I mean, not only are they not looking at the person, they're not looking at her through a cell phone or they're actually turning their back. I mean, I know I'm not as famous as Clinton, but I would have been a little worried if you all now were sitting with your back to me, looking at your cell phone or smartphone. You know, it's a crazy thing. But it's just because of innovation of the smartphone. People can do stuff they couldn't do before. I wonder what she was thinking. You know, it is pretty strange. But anyway, the innovation of the smartphone has changed a lot. So the third platform, the human being more open to, to exponential change or, or dramatic change, the smartphone. And the smartphone has really meant more, I think, than, than what we think. It has really replaced most everything you do, you know. It's a camera, phone, you know, mail, everything is going through here. And we have always been scared of machines taking our jobs, but the smartphone was, you know, no problem. I'll take that. But we're more scared of this. You know, robots will come and take us, and they will look like us. Why the hell would a machine look like us? The only thing a machine cannot do is the moving parts that we can. So why would it try to do that when it can do everything else better than us? I, I don't know if you have one, but I have one of these lawnmower mowers, you know, those, that rowboat. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, no one would think of developing that by having a human push your own old lawnmower, you know? It, that, that's not how it happens. It'll be totally different. Robots is not a machine, it's software. You know, it really is software. And it will take over most of what we do today. And we will do different things. And I hope, as a person, I hope what we will do is do the more human things. You know, the close-up with the students, our children, our sick, our old. And then we can have a robot do the stupid things. But they will not look like this, I promise you. And, and they will not go from being machines to become humans, like you see in films. Forget that. You know, it won't happen. But they will think, they will learn, but they won't have the human side. This is really also just a robot. Driverless cars is not a distant thing. They are here today. In Norway, now it starts becoming, you know, in big companies that have their own private lots where a lot of buildings, driverless buses take people around. You can go on, uh, online, you can see Kongsberg and a lot of these companies they have driverless buses with five to 15 people size that take people around. In January, Volvo will start selling driverless cars around Gothenburg in Sweden. It's not something which is far away into the future. It's something that's here. The technology is here. What's not here is the laws of the countries. In Norway, for instance, you cannot drive a car without having one hand on the wheel. Pretty 
difficult with, when there is no one there. And maybe not even a steering wheel. So. But those laws are changing in countries all over the world at all times. But it's not anything different than other uh, robots. So digitalization has come to a tipping point, but it's really not the destination. Digitalization is just a mean to get to the end goal, which is data. It's all about data. And it's really difficult because we create more data now than ever. And we actually create more data next week than we've done in all history of mankind combined. So do you and your organization have a strategy for how you can use that data? How you can protect that data? How you're storing that data? And do you really need to collect all the data you're collecting? Or are you being swapped by data so much that you don't know how to do and care about it? Digitalization is just a means. The goal is the data. And the internet of everything is nothing else than collectors of data, sensors, cameras, and so on. So you have to start thinking about the data. And the data is important. And when you do that, you should, you should really talk to people. You know, talk to someone. Find someone that can be your trusted advisor. I do that all the time. You know, and this is my bragging slide, okay? Give me that. No, but I really done this all my life. I have traveled the world to talk to people that are smarter than me. And there are a lot of them. You know, there are a lot of smart people around the world. And I've, I sit down and talk to them. At least one of these people or some of these people or some others that I trust, at least once a quarter. And I sit down for a day, I spend that day, and I'm trying to make sense of all the impressions I have, and I discuss it with these and other people. The most, you know, the, the most impressive person that I've spoken to is the Vice President Al Gore. It was, you know, just spending time with him and learning how much he spends on learning and talking to people and how much he knew about IT and that he has really been doing this all the way back from university times. And as I said, Satya, only weeks ago, the new CEO of Microsoft. And of course, some of these people are in the IT industry, others are not. But my point is really that you have to find not one, not two, but some people that can be your trusted advisor. Because when the world changes fast and you can lose or miss the curve, you better be pretty sure on what you do. You know? And this is what we try to be in Altea. And if we're not for you, then you can contact me anytime. So as I said, it's all about data. So my advice to you is to make a data, data strategy. A strategy of what you're going to collect, how you're going to collect it, how you're going to use it, and of course, how are you going to protect it? And not only protect it from getting lost, but also from being stolen. I mean, th those are two different things. Most information that get out of the house is actually just lost. It's not stolen and then misused. So how, what kind of data would you want to collect? How do you collect it? How do you store it? And how do you make it secure? Make your data strategy. It's important. And so in this, in this world, we're trying in Atea to develop this knowledge. And so take a, 
peek at this film. This is what we're trying to do. How lucky we are to be able to live and work in this part of the world. It's like winning the national lottery. Yet, we don't wake up every day feeling thankful. For us, life is easy. That's because our parents decided we should lead a better life than they did. Imagine if we did the same thing, gave our children an even brighter future by supporting all our dedicated teachers so that they can provide better education for generations to come. By giving healthcare's greatest minds the technology they require based on their needs wherever they are. Imagine if we can strengthen our industry, meeting the demands of tomorrow, and by doing so, saving jobs. By finding new ways to produce all the energy we need without polluting our environment. We want to improve our important infrastructure, not only for us who travel, but for the people getting us where we need to go and make things easier for all the farmers who tend our fields and livestock, putting healthy food on our tables. We at Atia have made a decision. We want to build a better future. So what I've been trying to wake you up with this morning is really, we're at a tipping point where digital is not a result, but just there. We're becoming digital or native in the digital world. It will, it will make the world and processes and companies and functions and services change faster. It will make the leaders of today become less leaders tomorrow faster than what we've seen before. It is all about automation, being connected, and data strategy. But most and foremost, it will be about we, the humans, being able to change fast enough. I hope you will have a great day, great week, great year. We're here to be your trusted advisor. Thank you.